Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's raised $21,954 for his mayoral campaign. Mike Bloomberg has already spent $5 million and could spend another $100 million. His wife has been his campaign manager. Mike Bloomberg has bought up all the high-priced political talent he can. His campaign office is a Republican club in Glendale, Queens. Mike Bloomberg's headquarters is in Manhattan Corporate. Glass, wood, state-of-the-art communications, conference rooms, kitchens, everything. Is this David versus Goliath or Don Quixote versus the windmills? He's Tom Agnabeni, Republican candidate for mayor. He served for 10 years in the city council, seven as the council's minority leader. He's a lifelong civic activist and longtime member of the Republican Party. But best of all, he's a Queens guy. Tom, welcome. Hiya. Now, are you tilting with windmills? Are you casting stones at giants? Or are you crazy? Well, maybe, according to you, maybe the third one comes closer. The only thing I'm doing is, is running for mayor of the city of New York. The Republican Party's entitled uh, to have a, uh, a choice. They're entitled to have uh, uh, candidates with opposing views who have different ideas about governance. And that's what I'm doing. You know, the Democrats traditionally have primaries. They have three people in it, four people in it. Nobody says they're crazy. Virginia Fields against Freddie Ferrer. You got Gifford Miller with 12 percent, uh, Anthony Weiner with 10 percent. Nobody says they're crazy. I decide to run one candidate against Michael Bloomberg, and everybody thinks somehow that this is a, a big offense or a big affront to the political process. No, no, I'm not saying it's an affront. I'm just want to know, are you nuts? You raised $22,000. No, I'm, I'm over $30,000 now. Oh, oh, yeah, right. Oh, excuse me. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in more. Listen, were the 1969 Mets crazy? Oh, please. Was John Markey crazy? Let okay, let's talk that. about John Markey. I yeah. mean, when you announced in February, there, yes. was, there was this, you know, surge of excitement, particularly among the chattering classes, that we could have a real primary. Yes. And there was this surge of enthusiasm. But then you come in with this, this fundraising that says to people out there, come on, he can't do it. Yeah, well, I, I don't know that the money alone is what's going to judge this campaign. But it's true because the people that I go to, all of them are just either intimidated or, or, or uh, afraid of Mike Bloomberg, they're afraid to challenge Mike Bloomberg. It's kind of sad because, you know, one of the famous sayings of John Paul II was, be not afraid. <laughs> and I don't know how to convince people out there that if you want to have a viable two-party system in this city, you shouldn't be afraid to make sure that there are candidates that are willing to challenge the norm. So I don't understand it. All I can do is offer myself as a candidate and say, look, the Republican Party is entitled to more than somebody uh, that just wants to give it lip service. Wait a second. Wait a second. What are they, these good Republicans that you are talking to, afraid of? Mike Bloomberg, no, I, I think enforcer? The, I, I mean, no, no I, I, I think, I, I think the, 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 big, the big ticket people, the people that, that have an interest in, in funding campaigns, oh. uh, the people in the real estate industry, the, uh, some of the unions that probably feel that he hasn't been fair to them, in terms of uh, a negotiation process, uh, people who have a stake in New York City, who have a financial mm -hmm. stake, who are willing to support candidates, because after all, people like myself need that kind of support. Right. I don't have $100 million in my back pocket. Or, but, or in fact, Freddie Ferrer, Gifford Miller, Virginia Fields, or any, anybody vis a vis Mike Bloomberg. Obviously, they're right. capable of doing it. Right. Obviously, people feel uncomfortable. Uh, there's a certain legitimacy is, uh, to running as a Democrat against this big uh, uh, aura of Michael Bloomberg, but somehow people feel uncomfortable with the fact that he's being challenged from within his own party. But I, I, I have no problem, you know, I ran for city council in a two and a half to one Democratic district. I think when I go out and I speak to the people and talk to them about what the real issues are and how important it is for our party to be represented as a party in the city of New York, I think I begin to make inroads. Can I win? I don't know. Okay, let's let's talk politics for another couple of minutes, and right. then then let's talk policy. Okay. Both Michael Bloomberg's policy and Tom Ognebeni's policy is right. made. The politics. 
You've got to get on the ballot. So yes. you've got to have petition signatures. Yes. You've got, it needs 7,500. You need at least 15,000 because you know they're going to be challenged. Yeah, that's Can true. you get 15,000 signatures? How do you pay? How do you, who are the troops? Uh, the troops are the rank and file Republicans that are in each borough who I know are dissatisfied with Michael Bloomberg, who feel he betrayed the party. And it's a matter of reaching out to them, and we're doing that with our website, and we're getting volunteers every day who are signing up. I have the Queens County organization behind me, a good people. Last year, they got over 7,500 signatures by themselves on behalf of the mayor. Now, don't question it's going to be a daunting task, because I know he's going to go out right away into areas in which I'm popular and try to soak up the signatures uh, right off the bat. Excuse well, me. We're going to go out there, and we're going to fight for every signature. Look, there's no battle that was ever fought at any time in politics uh, that was easy or that wasn't worth fighting because it was supposed to be too hard. I have a message, and the message is for rank-and-file Republicans who believe that this mayor is not a Republican, that he's turned his back on the party, that he hasn't been supportive of the party, and doesn't stand for what the party believes. And if you can allow this man uh, to proceed unchallenged to receive the Republican Party line, then we've really lost our party. Okay. Let's continue with the politics before we talk about right. Mike Bloomberg and his policies. So. Let's say you even, assuming you get on the ballot. Yes. And on September 13th, you're going to pull a John Markey, the out-of-borough, white, ethnic, Catholic Italian, beats the liberal, Republican, East Side mayor? Do you believe in this Markey scenario? Uh, yeah, I do. And I think what, what's important is that in politics, it's what you believe in that could come true. It's not just what Tom Agnew believes in. It's what the rank and file Republican primary voters believe in. Do they be, do they believe? What do they believe? Okay, talk. Let's get let's get to that. What do they believe in? What's a real Republican? You say Mike a real Bloomberg Republican, isn't I guess, one. No, I, well, obviously he isn't one because he says he isn't one. Obviously, okay. you know. Okay, it, so it's self admission. But if if you if you talk about the things that he stands for, when he came in, he said the most important thing was that I was the next step. That I was going to change the city. He took a, a Republican administration that changed the city. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the better, I think it did. I think Giuliani reduced welfare, reduced crime, did marvelous things, restructured government, uh, put some structural balance in the budget. Those are the kind of things that we supported in the 90s. Now you have Michael Bloomberg come in. He doesn't believe in reducing spending. He's made no effort to restructure government, to cut the cost. The budget's gone up between seven and nine billion dollars, twice the rate of inflation. And how does he answer that? Does he address that issue? Does he address workforce reduction? Does he address Medicaid and costs that are, that are rampantly out of control, that are robbing our city budget? No. What's his answer? His answer is go to the revenue side, raise property taxes, raise fines, raise fees. This is exactly the liberal democratic way of governing, not the Republican way of governing. Okay, now wait a minute. How do you run city government at the time that Mike Bloomberg faced the uh, the budget crisis that he did without raising taxes. Weren't, wasn't a raise in the property tax given our dependence on Albany? Isn't that, wasn't that the only solution? No, I don't think it was the only solution. His solution should have been to cut the expenses of government. Could you have cut them. it that much? In Absolutely. That period Let me of time? tell you something. Oh, let me tell you something. He not only refuses uh, to make the cut. Now, this is important, and I want to be honest about this because I don't, I don't want to be just confrontational. Right. The idea is, is that his first choice was to raise taxes. He made no genuine effort to look okay. at where he could have the savings. And that's important. His first option is always to go to the revenue side. Okay. And that's the difference between a Republican okay. and a liberal. So Democrat. it's not necessarily the outcome, but the, the, his, his whole mindset. He doesn't think whole mind, like exactly. a Republican. What else doesn't make him a Republican other than his... His well, on social taxes. issues, Go clearly, ahead. although he identifies and he says that there are other Republicans that have more liberal views on social issues, there's no Republican candidates ever that I can think of that supported gay marriage or partial birth abortion. These are two anathemas as far as conservative Republicans are concerned. And I have, it, it clearly distinguishes him on social issues. When it comes to crime, people say that, you know, he's, he's a crime fighter. The problem is that he denies that he's a Republican. He gives a wink when he says he's a Republican. But what made the city safe was a Republican agenda. It was a methodology that was developed under a Republican mayor. Now, when he came in, any mayor worth his salt could have done an effective job by just appointing a, a, a quality police commissioner. The fact is that he had to take a step further. He had to begin to address the issues that weren't able to be addressed under Giuliani, youth crime and gangs. 
Those are two important issues. He abolished the street crimes unit, which was our most effective method of, of interdicting crime before it happened. He's reduced the police force by 6,000 cops. You and I pay taxes under Safe Streets, Safe City to raise the police force by 8,000. He's retrenched on that commitment. And most of all, if you read the major newspaper articles that are coming out, the mayor has changed the reporting system. He's downgrading felonies to misdemeanors wait a minute, so that he's it gives juggling the appearance. The books? Absolutely. So this, wait a second. Absolutely. You're accusing the mayor of juggling the crime books and, and, and Absolutely. Ray, Ray what they've done is that they've re-rated certain crimes or they make sure where they're on the cusp that they're rated as misdemeanors because they, then they're not judged in the crime statistics as number of felonies. But wait a minute. And I think people around the city recognize that there has been no significant reduction in crime. But the important wait, thing wait, is Wait, wait, wait. Stop. 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 Wait yeah, a minute. Go ahead. There, there, come on. There has been a palpable reduction in crime, or at least certainly a maintenance under Bloomberg. Come on. A and, maintenance? No, no. I'll concede that there's oh, a maintenance. I you're telling me but all the, the stats. Point oh, is, come on. The point is it has nothing to do with Michael Bloomberg. What it had to do with the fact that a Republican administration in the 90s, of which I was a part of, devised a methodology for policing that the police now have today. And any mayor coming in worth his salt would have appointed okay. a police commissioner that could have carried it forward. What I'm telling you is that on important issues, the aggressive anti-crime enforcement, particularly with youth crime and with gangs, he's retrenched on that. And okay. We're going to pay the price okay. for that. I mean, we disagree. I don't think in December 2001 people would have said that the amount of crime across a broad range of statistical categories would be as low as it is. You don't you don't think that Mike Bloomberg's not going to run on this and get votes on that issue? He can, he can run and get votes on that issue, but the fact of the matter is as he distances himself from the Republican Party and its policies, it's the very policies of the Republican Party that make this city safe. Okay. Jets Dr. Roth over development. You're yeah. opposed to the stadium. You're opposed to big box development. Talk I'm not opposed to the stadium. I'm opposed to siting it on the west side of Manhattan. Okay, talk. Okay, look. You have the Hudson Yards, a property that's worth $900 million. The Regional Planning Association came up with three alternate plans that would have produced mixed-use residential and commercial. Far greater return on our infrastructure investment than the West Side Stadium. Obviously because you're generating tremendous amount of taxes with the co-ops and condos and the mixed-use commercial. So it's a better financial investment for the city. Instead, the mayor sticks in the West Side Stadium, and what does he do? He's ready to give it away to his friends for $100 million. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. His friends, million, the, yes. the Jets? Woody yeah, absolutely. Jets, Woody the, the Billionaires Club. Yes, you got it. Okay, go ahead. This is it, because the only people benefiting from, uh, from development in this city are friends of the mayor, Daniel Doctoroff. And that's oh, now we documented. take shots at the deputy mayor. Okay, let's finish with, let's, let's do the Jets. Go ahead. Let's do the Jets. So you got a stadium that he wanted to give away for $100 million. He complained about the Dolans, and I don't pass judgment on the Dolans' motives. I don't really care whether it was self-interest or otherwise. But the point is, by the fact that they moved, that they, they stepped into the process, we were able to generate at least a few more dollars, uh, $250 million instead of $100 million, where the mayor was willing to give it away. And the fact is that you and I are going to pay the price for that because the city taxpayers are going to have to invest upwards of $800 million, okay. money that could have been put in a mass transit, to put in a West Side Stadium in Manhattan, plus the transit fares are going to go up, and you could bet your bottom dollar on that to pay for that site. The Dolans, in fact, I mean, to, to go to your point about Cablevision and the Dolans, the Dolans spent $20 million in, in attempting to defeat the right. stadium. Damn now, the if they saved us, the strap hangers, you and right. I, we ride the subways, a couple of hundred million dollars, we should chip in a buck each and reimburse them. It was worth it because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have had all this money. Okay, talk about Dr. Off. You, yeah. You're not happy with the deputy. No, I, 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 I think that... If you look at some of the deals, Bronx Terminal Market, and I think there are other sites in which they uh, propose for Olympic development, that the developers that are getting the sweetheart deals are all those who were either associates or former associates of Dan Dr. So you're, uh, wait I, mean, a minute. I think there's a deep concern for that, and I think if, you know, I happen to be a, a conservative Republican that's always glad to read the Village Voice because I think they have some of the finest investigative reporters and Tom Robbins and, and uh, Mr. Barrett. And they do an effective job of rooting out uh, what, what I see as some what, a problematic uh, development on behalf of uh, the mayor's office and Mr. Doctoroff. And I think you ought to open your eyes and see what's going on there. 
So you're saying that what are you saying exactly? I'm in terms saying of that the mayor's having, economic development policy and the implementation of that, that policy. That they benefit mostly the people that are closely associated with Mr. Doctoroff. And you can draw your own conclusions from that. That certainly doesn't benefit my community. You know, one of the things you have to do with development, I always have a problem with it, is that development sometimes turns into overdevelopment. In other words, I like the residential character of our local communities. You start putting in this big box retail development and you destroy that character. I like it when you can come out of your house and you can go down to a local mom and pop store, a retail store, a bakery, uh, a, a, a confectionery store. Uh, these are the kinds of things that make our community solid, that holds them together. Mm -hmm. You know, putting in big box may have some you know, expedient benefit, but in the long run they destroy our communities. I don't think the mayor's focusing on that. Overdevelopment still taking place in our community. You know, he started, he had to be dragged into this growth management task force of Staten Island uh, by the borough president and by Jimmy Otto. And it's still just a task force that's going on examining and examining. You don't have to examine. Overdevelopment's rampant in Staten Island. And now the mayor's people want to support NASCAR. They haven't taken a good look at what that's going to cause to Staten Island. But don't we need development? Don't we need to grow the job and tax base in the... Yeah. But, Other boroughs as well as the, but the there's, there's certain the kinds of development. I think the new industries. I don't think just that the big box retail is going to do it. Right. You got the bi biotech industry, other major industries that you may want to attract here. Uh, because and the mayor's not doing that. I don't know. I don't know how effectively he's doing it. I think they're concentrating more on on a 2012 Olympics and what development's going to come from that. Uh, then on looking at industries that are going to become, become a permanent part of the New York City skyline. But let's let, let's just talk a little bit more about development. The Nets Arena in Brooklyn has not generated the amount of heat that the Jets Stadium has. But in fact, again, you've got public land being turned over in some way to a private it, developer. It's a matter of who's available to make the challenge. Obviously, in New York, uh, in Manhattan, the, the, the challenge was spurred on by the Dolans, who had $20 million to spend on that. The people out there, the, the, the local people that live out in Brooklyn are just getting stepped on, that's all. They, just, they don't have a so voice yet. So you're opposed yet. to that development as well? I'd like to take a look and see whether it's worthwhile. Okay. Talk about the schools. Obviously, yeah. the mayor is going to be running on his control of the schools. He's no, going to be I, running I don't think so. Crime. I think he's distanced himself from okay. that. Okay. So talk, why? Why is he distanced? Well, he, he Not took successful? Control, absolutely. He's Go taking ahead. a step backwards. Go ahead. And I'll tell you why. He took over the schools and he paid a billion dollars in salary and benefits uh, to get it. Not that I complain about the teachers getting a billion dollars in salary and benefits. Maybe they deserved it. But one of the things he complains about is he didn't get changes in the contract. He should have gotten the changes in the contract that he wanted then. So you can't use the contract as a red herring saying that's why education isn't taking place. The fact is education isn't taking place because the mayor's decided to run education from the Tweed building and he scripted education. Instead of really providing quality education in the classroom, turning over control of the schools to the principal, the administrators, to the teachers, allowing them to use their discretion and creativity, he has this scripted methodology, which is very strict. You teach from 10 to 10, 15, one subject. The kids aren't learning. What he's doing, he's force-feeding them information so that they can take tests and raise the, 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 the standards, the test standards up by a couple of percentage points so he can beat his breast and say that education is taking place. In fact, he's robbing kids of a creative education. Okay. Furthermore, Go ahead. furthermore, and I know this as being a trustee of a parochial high school in the city of New York by talking to parents who don't want to send their parents, uh, their kids to junior high school and high school because it's not safe and he hasn't done anything about that. And until you do something about that, you're not providing a quality education. Okay, let's talk about taxes. I disagreed with you earlier. What do you do, what do, you do with this property tax? You're going to repeal the 18.5% property Absolutely. tax? Absolutely. And what, how big a hole are you going to produce? You're not going to have a hole. Let me tell you Go something. Ahead. Let me tell you something. You're not going to have You look a at Nassau County and hole. you look at some of the counties. Go ahead. What's the biggest problem we have in our budget today? It's Medicaid and health costs. They're outrageous. New York State spends more than any other state in the union. We have California's second... Right. And they have 15 million more residents that they have to take care of. There are states like Massachusetts that spend half as much as we do per capita 
and give a better yeah, but this quality. This is the governor. This is your this buddy. This isn't the, the governor. This is governor. the city. You know what oh, Tom Swozzi is doing ahead. in Nassau go County? Ahead. Go ahead. What he's simply saying is, I'm not paying my Medicaid bill. Till you come to the table and negotiate, I'm not paying it. And you have to have some moral courage and do that. Because if we continue to pay 25% sometimes and, and, and then 100%, the we cannot afford to do the kinds of things we want in the city of New York. The city of New York is being taxed, an unfunded mandate by this state, to the tune of five to six billion more than we have to pay for Medicaid, and we could do a, as equally a good job in providing health services. It's not about servicing the poor, as the mayor said, because most of our health care costs go in long-term services, not in acute care. So the mayor doesn't even understand that. And the other thing is the mayor has a $300,000 city workforce where common sense tells you that you only need about 242,000 employees to run the city. Workforce reduction, Medicaid reduction are the two things that are the salvation of the city. But the mayor won't address it. The mayor even opposed the governor's $1 billion reduction in Medicaid, a small amount. He just wanted to move in, in, in the opposite direction in terms of health care, and the mayor resisted it. That's the point. Okay. You, I love this. Yeah, I mean, two Queens guys at the table. Right. Okay, let's go back to politics. Go Quinnipiac, back to politics. Quinnipiac shows you in a Republican primary losing 65 to 16 percent. Yes. Let's just let's just think of the unimaginable, and you lose the Republican primary. Yes. You get your petition signatures. You get enough money to run a campaign. Go ahead. Big ifs. What do you do? Oh, I, I, well, I uh, have asked for. And I expect to receive, although I don't make that decision, the conservative party line. And, and Mike Long has said publicly that you are the odds-on favorite. Okay. Well, that's nice so you lose the Republican primary yes. and you're on the conservative line. Yes. Now, what happens in November? Close election. Tom Agnabeni gets 6 7% of the vote. Close election. Freddie Ferrer or Virginia Fields or Anthony Weiner or Giff Miller or the mayor. And you caused it. Well, you say, I mean, how, well, well, how are you a good Republican? Well, you say I caused it. I'm a good Republican. Show me the difference Go ahead. between Michael Bloomberg and any of the four people you just mentioned. Quickly. Okay, so it's not spoiling because you get the same thing. There's nothing saying. to spoil. Okay. In order to be a spoiler, you have to have something to spoil. Michael Bloomberg came to us and he said, I'm the next step. I'm a Republican. I had an epiphany. And he went out and did everything in opposition to what we stood for, and he thumbed his nose at the party. Why would any self-respecting Republican want to pull the lever for Michael Bloomberg? Wait a minute. Excuse me. You've got four county organizations that back Michael oh, Bloomberg. Oh, nonsense. What? Excuse me. They did. Listen, and Doug, you've been in politics for a long time. I was, first of all, frozen out, wasn't even invited to the meetings. After I got Queens, the county leaders all got called from the governor. They got called from the state chairman. Their arms were muscle. twisted. Let me, absolutely. And let me tell you when I went out to Staten Island. They invited me because I had always worked well with Staten Island, and they were very courteous. And I thank Bob Helbach, the county chairman, for inviting me. When I walked in, they told me off the bat, you know, Tom, you understand politics. I said, Bob, I'm not upset with it because I was an insider once, and I understand it. But you were courteous enough to invite me. And I spoke to those Republicans at that meeting. Do you know to a person all of those Republicans said, Tom Ogden is the better candidate for mayor? Well, what's what, what's this? Wait, excuse me. These are the excuse real me. Republicans and yes. they're gutless. They're not going to vote for you. Because no, I, I, I think what happens is they wind up being loyal to their leadership. And even though they disagree with their leadership, they feel that they have to have some coherency in party organization. And I understand it. <sighs> Come on. But those aren't the people I'm concerned about. It's the voters out there. It's the people. Can you get your message out? I mean, that, that that's gets well, back to the money. You Come just on. you just you just asked a sixty-four dollar well, question. I, yeah, I but then that's out? all you have. In, in kind of how are you going to do it? How do you get your message out if you're raising now thirty thousand dollars? Really, let me seriously. Let me tell you something. I was a member of the Conservative Party in the sixties, seventies, and eighties, and people used to have the same derogatory attitude towards us. Till we eliminated Charlie Goodell from the state senate, till we got rid of Jake Javits, till we almost won the mayoralty oh, with Lou Lerman. You're scoring with my audience. Let Go me ahead. tell you something. Go ahead. Let me tell you something over here. You start out small, but if you believe in what you believe in and you stand for something and you stand on principle and belief in your party, then that's important. You know, people always think that the politics is really about the guys with the multi-million dollar uh, payrolls. I remember when the Florida Marlins uh, won the World Series. And take a look at the New York Knicks and all the money that they spent. It's not just about money. It's about having something more. It's about having character and believing in what you stand for. And if there weren't people that stood up in this world and started out small and said, look, 
We have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. And if we're going to allow our party to be taken over by the likes of Michael Bloomberg, then we will not have a two-party system in New York. I don't know if you remember, but there was a young man, an assemblyman in 1981, who ran against Ed Koch. His name was John Esposito. He was an assemblyman. Right. And he went for the Republican line. The Republicans said, boy, oh boy, we don't need you. You stand for nothing. You can't raise money. All the same arguments they make against me. And they crowned Ed Koch. They gave him the Republican line. John Esposito ran on the conservative party line because he stood for something. And I was part of that campaign. I was his co-campaign so manager. You're si this and he is said, let me just say, ahead, he said, ahead, if you allow this to happen, you give up the Republican Party. And he was absolutely right. The Republican Party lost all control of the political agenda in the city of New York for 10 years. Well, and what you're telling me is that there is no ideological Republican Party. Essentially, they're all for hire. There is a price. You no, and I know I'm what the talking about the leadership. That, that no, they're whores. They I'm, can be bought. Uh, the, That's the, what the, you're the saying. The leadership of this party. Well, I have I have state senators. State senators. I had one state senator who refused to admit me to a Republican meeting in Brooklyn. It's a state senator, and I ask him, let me ask you something over here. And it's, uh, uh, do you believe in the, the, the tax increase? No, I, I voted against it. Do you believe in gay marriage? No. Do you believe in partial birth abortion? No. As a matter of fact, this state senator is fighting the mayor on the expansion of the U.N. in the Turtle Bay. Right, and? He told me, you've got to get out of the meeting. I've got to call this meeting for Bloomberg. I'm supporting Bloomberg. This so is they, a nonsense. They all have we have price. a state senator. You're surprised at this? You, an insider, are surprised that uh, this is going on? I'm I surprised. Think you are I tell surprised. you why. I tell you, yes, I am. I am. I am surprised. See, and you're disappointed because too, no? I'm disappointed because I'll tell you why. Because what I had started out to do, the mayor wouldn't even give a second look at the Republican Party. You'll notice since I jumped into this race that the mayor's gone to every Republican county. Uh, he's, he's paid. You should get money from I, I now, them. From I'll tell him. you what. I'm the greatest employment agency for unemployed Republican attorneys. <laughs> Go ahead. Now, the mayor, for the first time now, all of a sudden is talking and acting like a Republican. They shouldn't have sold out. You know who has courage? Dennis Gallagher. Jimmy Otto. Because for three and a half years, he treated them disrespectfully at the city council. And the day after I announced that I was running, he had his aides run in there and say, what can we do for you? And they said, how about all the things you denied our constituents for the last four and a half years, three and a half years? Okay. We have so I know that I was making a point about the Republican Party, and these people sold out before they held the, the mayor's feet to the fire. Okay. When you win on uh, September 13th, you're going to be on the show uh, the following morning? I expect to be on the show the following morning, no matter what happens. Thank you. Take care, Tom.